1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Praise God. Amen. Well, all greetings to you all in the precious, wonderful name of Jesus and welcome this morning. And uh, we trust that you'll get something out of the message this morning. We've had a time of praise and worship in the presence of the Lord. And the presence of the Lord will always do us good. Amen. There is joy, fullness of joy in the presence of God. So this morning, uh, the message that has been uh, laid on my heart for some time, and uh, it's become absolutely necessary, I feel, to share it at this point in time. The title of the message is Becoming Solution-Minded. Becoming Solution-Minded. And our key text is found in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Let's read it, and then we'll get into the message. It says, No temptation has seized you, Accept what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the reading of your word, the meditation of your word. Father, may the preparation of our hearts, Lord, and the preparation of my heart do us good this morning where this message is concerned. Lord, add light, bring understanding, and bring relevance to it. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So becoming solution-minded, and the theme is this. We need to develop a problem-solving approach to life. We need to develop a problem-solving approach to life. In case you have not noticed, Problems are not going away anytime soon. Have you noticed that? Or was it just me? It was not one thing, then it's another. In the book of Job, the Bible says, and uh, people came in, the servants of Job came in, and they said, the Sabians have taken away all your livestock. And while the Bible says, while they were speaking, another servant came in and said, all your other equipment has been taken away. And you're know, listening to all of this and he's thinking like, is this Monday? Monday? What's going on? And while they were speaking, another servant came in and said, your sons were rejoicing in the eldest son's home, or your children in the eldest son's home. And there was a great storm and the roof fell in and all your children are here. At that point, Job took off his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, sat in the dust, and threw dust or ash over his head. That's the kind of problems he was having all in one day. And the Apostle Paul said, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Those are the words of reality. Amen. Amen. We are not destroyed, he says. So in case you haven't noticed, problems are not going away anytime soon. Problems are yet to stay. And Paul expressed that in this passage of scripture. And we, we read through the book of Job and we know the challenges that, know, that Job experienced as well. So the point this morning is this. Adopt the right mindset going forward. Adopt the right mindset. Don't give up and give in in the face of despair, challenges, and problems. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, it says, Go to the end. Go to the end and consider her ways. Go to the end. We can learn a lot from nature. We can learn a lot from God's creation. I don't know if you are experiencing a pandemic of ends right now. Where do you live? Have you noticed that? Okay, I thought it was just that front me down in place where I live. You know, that's what ends. But what you do is you put down poison all over, you kill them, and they spring up somewhere else. Yeah. You, you put poison here, they spring up somewhere else. Yeah. Yep, you know, they're just all over. So the Bible says, go to the end to stop our and consider her ways. And we can learn from the end. The end lives by a very simple motto. And what is that motto? Get the job done at any cost. Even if it costs me my life. Get the job done at any cost. And that is how, that's 
the kind of mindset we need to um, adopt and live by. To say, get the job done at any cost. Doesn't matter what's coming up and what's going wrong in my life. Amen. Listen to this. Don't let the devil frustrate you. You frustrate the devil. Did you get that? So the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5 verse 9, it says, but resist him, that means the devil, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences are suffered by your brethren who are in the world. Yes, the truth. You're not the only one going through something right now. The Bible is very clear that your brethren throughout the world are experiencing challenges of their own kind and of their own nature. You're not the only one going through something. But the Bible says this, it says resist him. Don't let the devil frustrate you. You frustrate the devil. Can I give you the reason why? You are connected to an endless source of energy and power from the kingdom of God. You are connected to the eschem of this life. You are connected to God. The devil is not connected to anything or anyone. He doesn't have a boundless supply of energy and power. But you have if you are connected and if you are walking with God and if you are in God. Amen to that. Adopt a mindset that says, I have a problem solving attitude in life. Amen. At this point in time, we'd like to just throw up a pick for you. And uh, we'll just reference that pick and uh, move forward from there. I saw this some time ago and uh, the picture itself really ministered to me and caught a hold of my attention. Now we've got some words around the picture. And it goes like this. I don't fix problems. I fix my mind. And the problems solve themselves. Do you know what's the biggest problem? The biggest problem is the problem you have on your mind. Yeah. The biggest problem is the problem you see, you perceive, and you interpret as a problem. That's the biggest problem. So this little saying is so powerful. He says, I don't fix problems. I fix my mind and problems solve themselves. Resist the thought to give in to anger and frustration to the point that you want to give up. Resist that with everything that is within you. All of these challenges that are coming along, all of these issues that are cropping up all over in your life, it is designed to cause you to go deeper into God. Is to go deeper into his presence. It's to unblock those wells that you did not know exist. Sometimes when it feels like you are about to burst, it's the power of God that wants to keep up from out of the wells that's deep within your spirit. Hallelujah. It's not for you to give up and to say, I'm just going to burst with all of this. The power of God wants to come forth. Hallelujah. And the Bible is pretty clear. It says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from their woe. So what can we deduce going forward um, in light of that introduction? Number one, problems are all over. Problems are here to stay. Number two, I must adopt a problem-solving, problem-solving attitude going forward. And this morning I'm going to give you a simple biblical approach for dealing with life's problems. A biblical approach. Psalm 34 verse 19 and we read some scripture again. It says the afflictions of the righteous are many. But the Lord rescues him from them all. So I'd like to go through some statements that are erroneous that we hold on to. And we live by these, these, these standards and these codes. And, and it's what takes away from our quality of life because we have a wrong mindset. And the first wrong mindset is this. If I solve this problem, I will live happily ever after. Number one, fairy tales. Problems don't go away. You solve one problem, another comes. That's the truth. That's gospel truth right there. You're not going to solve one problem and live happily ever after with no problem. Something else is coming after this. You better set yourself up for that. Problems are here to stay. More so because you are saved. The Bible says that the afflictions of the righteous are many. And it is, not, it is happening largely because you are saved. Because you are a Christian. 
Christian, a child of God, listen to this. If you're going to make a stand for God, you will have to face the wrath of the enemy. Life is not fair at times, but God is. And the righteous shall live by faith. Here's another statement you hear. When did life become so difficult? Heard that? Said that? Newsflash, it's not getting any easier. Or it's not going to get any easier. And that is why the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. Realize, recognize, and believe that God has a fix for every problem in life. In Genesis chapter 1, God saw a problem. And God solved the problem. God is a problem solver. And if we adopt that mindset, we will go far in life through all the challenges and everything we face in life. If we adopt that mindset, I am here to solve problems. Can I help the unemployed this morning? Far too often the unemployed, the unemployed submit a CV. And it's no more than a well-dressed P for help that says, please employ me. It's no more than a very eloquent plea to say, I need a job. Listen, people are looking for you to solve their problems. Pharaoh had a problem. Joseph came up with a solution. Joseph got hired. Now you might say that's in the Bible, not in the real world. It applies to the real world too. Prove to someone that you can solve their problems, they will hire you. The person who hires a person or an individual based on what is written on a CV because he studied for so many years, he's got so many certificates hanging on his wall, is a fool to hire someone. You need to look for someone who's got skills and ability to solve problems in life. There are problems all over. We are looking for solutions. Praise God. That's what we are looking for in people. That's what we are looking for in life. That's what we are looking for in politics as well. And God was a problem solver. The industry is looking for problem solvers. And so off the back of the statement, when did life become so difficult? Can I just say this? Bread does not rise in a cold oven. It takes heat to get it to rise. So too with our faith. Hence the Bible says that the trying of your faith brings forth. It's the trying of your faith. Here's another statement that I'd like to bring forward and to just share with you. Some people live by this notion. The older I get, the easier life will become. And this is a, a good opportunity to speak to the young people in the house. Not to frustrate you, not to intimidate you, not to steal your joy or your optimistic look, look or view that you might have of life. But if you are living by this notion, the older I get, the easier life will become. Wrong. Another error. Get that out of your thinking. Get that out of your thinking. See, some of the older folk are laughing. They know what I'm talking about. The older you get, the more hassles, the more challenges come your way. When I was young, and then all the time I was young, believe you me, I used to look at older people and say, what is that? That old brother couple has got so many issues. Lord, if I was God, I would allow older people to have an easier life. Why does it get more difficult for them? They're getting old more, they can barely walk. Look at all the challenges. It doesn't get easier. Couple of lovely needs, wobbly needs are not going to make you exempt from life challenges. You're still going to have some issues. Wobbly needs are all. <laughs> You'll be problem solving till your dying day. One scripture for that, Elisha was solving Israel's problems on his deathbed. 2 Kings 13, 14. Now Elisha had fallen sick with the sickness whereof he died, and Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And I'll spare you the rest of the scripture. Basically what he was saying was this, what are we going to do now? You died. You ever had relatives come and gather around the deathbed of someone that's dying? <laughs> Normally we support them, we comfort them, we encourage them. But the last thing you do is look at a dying person and say, Can you pay for my car? Can you give me some money, please? You know, whisper down there and cry to them. Let's go to them. Let's go to them. Instead of coming to sympathize with Elijah. 
Elisha. Elisha's dying. He says, what am I going to do now? You die. He's crying over him. And Elisha has got to get up from that bed, open the east window, and release an arrow of the Lord's deliverance and help him one last time. Listen, you're going to be solving problems till the day you die. So get ready for this. But let me give you some help. Let me give you some help. I didn't come here to this. Cause you to despair. Your grasp of problem solving, your approach, and your leaning into God will make your golden years more productive. If you see an older person that's living with some sort of ease, it's a person who has learned to deal with life and life's challenges. They've learned that from their 20s and 30s, this problem's not going to kill me. This problem's not going to take away my peace and my joy. You're not going to rock me of my health. I'm going to have a good holiday. Problems you can stay behind. And when I come back, if you're still there, I'll deal with you when I get back. But I'm going to have a good holiday. I'm going to live, I'm going to sleep well. It's the mindset that changes as you get older. That makes life more pleasant and, and, and livable. It's not so much that your problems have been minimized. They're still there. But the mindset has changed. You now say, listen, I faced this when I was 20. It didn't kill me. I'm still here today to tell the story. And this is not going to kill me. This is not going to end me. This is not going to end my business. You know what I'm saying? So Psalm 92 verse 12 to 15 says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in their own age, materially. Physically, spiritually, financially, they will still bear fruit in their old age, says the word. They will stay fresh and they will stay green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there's no wickedness in him. So again, speaking into the life of those who are getting older. Listen, your quality and quantity of life will certainly improve. Why? You've learned to trust God more. Instead of being overwhelmed by problems, you are more overwhelmed by what the scriptures have to say. You are now making room in your heart for God or in your life for God's power. When problems come as you get older, you say, Lord, in my 20s, I really limited you in terms of how you influence and how you stepped into my life. But now that I'm older, I've learned that I should just step back and read. And now you make room for God to come. And you make room for Him to work because you know God will never fail you. Amen. So your quantity and quality of life will certainly improve. But not without its fair share of challenges. Let me read to you from Mark chapter 10 verse 30. This is known as the reward of the righteous. It says that he shall receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and land, along with persecution. And in the world to come, eternal life. So he says you will be blessed as life goes on. You will be rewarded, but not without persecution as well. So here's the deal. You can't have roses without thorns. And remember this, speaking into the lives of those that are getting older. This is not to discourage you, to cause you to despair. Remember this, God's hand over your life will never ever be lifted. God's hand of provision, God's divine hand of providence will forever remain over your life, today, tomorrow, and the next day. And here's some comforting news. Nothing can happen to you without surpassing the throne of God. Satan had to get permission to hack into Job's life. We have to face problems, that's the reality of God. We have to face problems, and some of these problems have your name written on it, in case you haven't noticed. It's not time to curl up and die. That's a defeatist mentality. You need to boldly declare, I am a child of the King. I am a child of God. I've got God's DNA in me. Hallelujah. If I'm not the reason for the problem, but if it has come my way, then God has seen fit for it to happen. He knows something I don't know. So God commanded young Joshua and said, Be strong and be courageous. And the word of encouragement 
encouragement to us today is still the same. Be strong and be courageous. Why did God encourage Joshua? Because he knew what Joshua was going to face in the promised land. And God knows that you've got opposition in your life. Yes, there's blessing. Yes, he's going to walk with you. But he knows that there are going to be challenges as well. You're going to go through the valley of the shadow of death. So he says, be strong. And he says, be courageous. Be strong and courageous. Glory to God. Because opposition will come. He knows that. But he's telling you that you need to be strong and to be courageous. Let me move on to the next point and then I'll, I'll give you the final point of this message. Not every mountain is going to move just because you pray. We are talking about problem solving, about adopting the right mindset. And then you've got in life what is called the very extremist view. And this extremist faith view maintains that you must not have any problems in life. I don't know if you've heard of that or seen that or read that. You must not have, if you're having any problem, something's wrong in your life. You've either done something wrong, you failed to tire, you're not praying like you should, or something is wrong in your life, you open the back door to the devil. Now, I don't submit to that experience, you forgive me. I don't uh, submit to that experience, you. I maintain that in life there are going to be challenges, and that God has given us faith to deal with life's challenges. He would not have given us faith if we were not supposed to face problems mm -hmm. or deal with them. He wouldn't have given us faith. He would have just given us a good uh, something else, knowledge of the Bible, and say, that's all you need, because now, now that you say, I've removed all your problems, now you just walk through life, just breathe through, and there'll be no issues. No, he's given us faith because he knows there are going to be things we're going to face in this life. Now, not every mountain will move because you are afraid. Let me elaborate on that point because it sounds like a negative one to begin with. There was a a writer by the name of George Bernard Shaw who said, if you cannot get rid of the skeletons in your closet, you better take them out and teach them to dance. <laughs> you are not going to get rid of all the problems in life. You're going to have to learn to take them out and deal with them as life goes by. Not every mountain is going to move just because you're praying. We've heard the saying, speak to this mountain and it will be cast into the sea. Tell you what, if that was right, if that was right, Table Mountain wouldn't be where it is today. Someone would have transported it to Europe, it would have been in Sweden right now. And we, we wouldn't have Drakensberg. There would be no Drakensberg Bridge. Some Americans would have just come and taken it. By faith, move it over the sea. Hey, it's in Colorado. And we just got sand dunes. We could just see forever like a mountainside. It would have taken a mountain. Not every mountain can be moved in life. Now let me help you. In Mark 11, where this passage of scripture comes from, Jesus said, speak to this mountain. Have you noticed that in the scripture? He said, speak to this mountain. He was pointing to something specific in life. You cannot speak to every mountain and expect you to move in life. Some mountains will move. Some mountains are meant to challenge you and you've got to learn to deal with them. When God spoke to young Jeremiah, he said to him, can these bones live? Not all the bones in the cemetery or in West Point Cemetery. He said, can these bones live? These specific ones. Let God point to the specific things that need to be moved in your life. Amen. That's why Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. If he said to the dead man, come forth, everyone in the cemetery would have came up that day. But he had to call just Lazarus. Because he needed just Lazarus. Amen. So I love the prayer of serenity. I think it's on the overhead surround about now as we are speaking. The prayer of serenity. It says, God grant me serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Can I just say this? Herein lies the dilemma. We do not know what needs to be changed. Versus what cannot be changed. And we go to all back to front and we're fighting things that should not be changed, wondering why is God not answering prayer, wondering why is this happening in life, when in actual fact this cannot be changed. But that can be challenged, that can be changed. And this is why I love this prayer. It says, Grant me the serenity, it means the peace and the presence of mind to accept certain things that are not going to go away. Amen. And then the wisdom to know the difference, as 
as to what needs to be changed in my life. So it brings us to another point in this message, known as all spawn and the flesh. How many of you know this message of scripture heard about all spawn and the flesh? And um, so many times you hear people say this, and uh, you'll read this in different uh, publications about all spawn and the flesh. And people ask the question, what was all spawn and the flesh? What was Paul talking about when he said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh? And Paul says, I prayed three times that God would take it away. And each time he did not answer me. But on the third time, God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Faith does not remove everything. The man who knew about faith and taught us faith himself, by his faith, could not deal with this problem. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul says this, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Some problems remain to keep you dependent on God. So Paul was praying about this issue. And God said, you know, I'm not going to remove it. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And then God said something else to him. He says, lest you be exalted about measure. Paul was running a marathon and there was no one catching up with this guy. He was light streets ahead of most people in the church. And that includes Peter, James and John and all the other merry, merry fellows that were in the church at the time. He was light streets ahead in revelation, in knowledge. He was just moving. And God said, lest you be exalted above measure, there's something given to you to bring you down to earth, to humble you, to make you realize you are like all these people that you are preaching to. And speaking to. You are not about them. You are praying about that person's weakness, but you also have a weakness. And God left that weakness and God said this to him so that you will learn to depend on me. Anytime we want to pray about things in life that God should bring into our lives that will leave us independent of God, God says, No, you are always to depend on me. And so God said, my grace is sufficient for you. So listen, church, whenever difficulties arise, the first thought is this. You like to treat it like an aching tooth. Please take it out, doctor, right away. No, you don't want to talk. You don't want an x-ray. You don't want a whole synopsis of why the tooth is doing this and why it's doing that. You don't want a whole talk and you're using the wrong toothpaste. You're using the wrong brush. You just want it out so the pain can stop. Are we not like that in life? Every time we pray, we just say, Lord, stop. Take the truth out. But this is what the Bible says. Paul says God gives us grace to bear up under the load. But when you are tempted, He will provide a way of escape so you can stand up under it. It's not all about escapism, it's about grace to stand up under the pressure and to say, Look, I'm standing, devil. I'm still standing. I'm standing, and I'm still standing. Let me tell you the story about a man very quickly, and then I'll get into the last segment of this message. Let me tell you the story very quickly. There was a man who had a dream one night, and the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, In your backyard is a large rock. I want you to put your back against it and push against it. And the dream ended. And so the man woke up and he interpreted that God wanted him to go to this rock in his backyard and push it away. So he said, well, you know, that's impossible in the natural, but if God said so, then maybe I should obey God. And so he went out into the backyard and he began to push it to no avail. Next day, he came again and he tried. And he did this for several days until he was finally discovered the rock had not moved one inch. It didn't budge and he gave up. Several days later, he had another dream in which the Lord appeared to him. And the Lord asked him, why have you given up? Didn't I ask you to put your back against the rock and push? He says, yes, what I did. I've been pushing and I've been pushing every day faithfully. He says, but unfortunately, Lord, the, Lord, the rock hasn't moved. And God said, really? He says, stand up and look in the mirror. He says, look at your shoulders, how broad they are. Look at all the muscles in your back that are now gripping. He says, look how strong you have been. And you see, here's the essence of that story. Not all problems will go away. But I can tell you this. 
you will come away with mountain moving faith that will see you strong in your old age, your golden years, and in the years to come. Hallelujah. You will be stronger for it more than anything else. Very quickly now, in closing, let's deal with the right approach towards problem solving. And I'll read to you from Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. Matthew 6, verse 34 says, Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Give your attention, your entire attention, to what God is doing right now, that is today. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever things come up when the time comes. That's found in Matthew 6, 34, in the New Living Translation. Amen. Did you get that? So, the first thing when one is faced with problems and faced with challenges, whether you are facing something right now, or if something new has just developed in your life right now. Point number one, take a step back and evaluate the situation. Take a step back and evaluate the situation. In other words, we need you to identify the problem. Take a step back and evaluate the situation. Identify the problem. For example, many times, or many times, but maybe you are praying for finances. You you are short of a certain sum of money. And you are praying, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm short of so much. Uh, Lord, I need X amount of money in my budget. The company needs X amount to run by. The church needs X amount to run by. You're asking God for this money. But you know what? The Lord may want you to see that what you need is wisdom, not more money. Because the Lord will help you to see that perhaps you are doing something wrong in the running of your house and in the running of your business. That's resulting in you hemorrhaging finances and always coming up short one thing. Sometimes you may need wisdom. Now you realize, hang on and say, wait a minute, that's right. It's not more money that I need, it's more wisdom that I need. Now you can pray for wisdom instead of finances. Do you see what I'm saying? So when you correctly identify the situation or the problem, you can pray accordingly. Sometimes we don't know what's wrong. We're like babies, you know, babies do that. You know, they just cry. They can't speak. They can't point. They just cry. Mother was figuring out by herself what's wrong. Feel and use her intuition, motherly instincts, and say, no, this is wrong with the baby. But babies just cry. And sometimes we are like that. We just pray about situations and we haven't taken time to step back and be and say, why are you the problem? Instead of just praying, 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 and you wonder why you're not getting answers. So is that clear? Point number one. Point number two, don't be overwhelmed by what you see. Don't be overcome by what you see, the magnitude of the situation. How big the problem, how much I owe, how much I need, how much of healing I need in my body. Don't be overwhelmed by what you see. And I like this cliche, don't tell God how big your mountain is. Tell your mountain how big your God is. Remember, we serve a mountain moving God. A problem solving God. You cannot hope to get the victory if the biggest thing on your mind is the problem. Hallelujah. So don't be overwhelmed by what you see. Number three, commit your problem to the Lord. You've ascertained what the nature of the situation is. You've categorized the problem. You can even name it for that matter. Don't be overwhelmed by what you see. Thirdly, commit it to the Lord. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, Casting all care upon him because he cares for you. The Bible says to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And there's just a little point that I want to share with you. Sometimes God changes things. Other times God changes you. Amen? Amen. Right. Point number four, walk in the light as he is in the light. Knowing the will of God for your situation is crucial to the outcome of the situation. Listen to this, not every good idea is a God idea. If you haven't figured that out or experienced that for yourself, then take it from me, from someone who's tried it time and time again, especially in things pertaining to ministry. Not every good idea is a God idea. A good idea needs God's blessing. 
A God idea has God's blessing on it. Just because it's a good idea doesn't mean to say it's going to work out. Abraham and Sarah thought it would be a good idea to have a son outside of Mary, and they had each one. Now they're fighting each other in the Middle East. Looks like Guy Fox right now. Don't mean to make light of the situation, but there they are fighting each other. All because he decided it's a good idea to have a son. Holy Mishnah. There we go. Walk in the light and know God's plan for your life. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is destruction. But in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your steps. Pray about anything and pray about everything. Point number five. Take care of the natural and God will take care of the supernatural. Do what you can and God will take care of the rest. The trouble is we often get caught doing God's work. We want to do the impossible and then we expect God to take care of the natural. So Jesus looked at the situation with the loaves and the fishes in John chapter 6. There was a multitude of about 5,000 people. And Jesus looked up, saw a great crowd coming towards him and he said, Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? If you've got the, your scriptures available to you, you can read it in John chapter 6 verse 5. Jesus says, where shall we buy bread? Have you noticed he didn't ask uh, Philip for directions to the nearest shop to say, where can I get bread? Or where can you get bread? He said, where can we? That's you and me. God wants involvement with you in your circumstances. Wants you to involve him. So he said, Where can we get bread? But here's the Creator Himself offering to become involved in a problematic situation. But Philip is stumped. He's stumped. He says, I don't know. He says, 200 grams, 200 denarii of wages will not be enough. Philip looks and he says, So Andrew looks and he says, There's a boy here. Loaves and a few fishes. But he says, What is that among so many of us? What is that among so many of us? The right way to solve the problem is to do what the boy did. He didn't look at the problem, he didn't look at the resources, he looked to Jesus and he placed what he had in Jesus' hands. And that's when the miracle started. And that's the point. That's the lesson we need to learn from this. It's not the impossibility or the absurdity in the situation. We simply commit it to Him. Believe and trust that all things work together for our good. Amen. In Jesus' name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So those are the five pointers that uh, one needs to adopt when facing challenges and problems in life. And then in conclusion, expect Him to answer. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and 2, the Lord answered me and said, you see, the trouble is we don't expect God to answer so soon. We've got this notion that if you pray today, God will answer next year this time. Somewhere in our philosophy, in our thinking, we have accepted that notion that if you pray, prayer involves patience. You must wait. And yes, there are some things to wait for. If you're 12 years of age and you're praying for a life, you would have to wait for a very long time. It is a waiting period sometime. You know, made according to order. We haven't made it yet. So you'll have to wait until we make it. Okay. Some things you'll have to wait for. But we have this notion that our prayer today, I'm, I'll expect an answer next year sometime. You know, God can answer you while you're praying. In Psalm 118 and 5, David says, In my distress, I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. Did he not say, The days are coming when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him? So seed. And this is portion of scripture where Hezekiah is lying dead and lying sick on his bed. Second Kings chapter 20. He's lying sick on his bed. The prophet Isaiah comes into his room and says to him the following good news: Set your house in order, or you shall surely die. Turns around and walks out. The man of God, or the king, Hezekiah, turns, faces the wall, and he weeps before God. Christ to God. God didn't take a month, a week, a year 
to answer him. He answered him on the spot. How do we know that? Watch this. The prophet who said to him, you are going to die, is walking through the court. And the Bible says before he reached the middle, before he reached the middle, the word of the Lord came to him and said, turn around, go back, and tell him I have heard his praise. I have heard his cry. I will heal him and I will give him 15 more years. Hallelujah. I will heal him and give him 15 more years. Praise God for that. Let's do an exercise this morning as we bring this to a close. I want to decree some divine reversal of fortune over your life. Are you ready for this? May the person that brought you bad news now bring you good news. Amen. Amen. The people that told blind Bartimaeus to keep quiet and not trouble the master now called him cheerfully saying, he calls for you. May those who criticized you become your cheerleaders in life. May those who defamed you now sing your praises. The reward that Haman was building for himself went to Mordecai. And the gallows he was building for Mordecai was reserved for him. Halfway through the problem, God will come through for you. The lies Potiphar's wife told about Joseph led to his promotion. Every lie ever told about you will work for your good in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Expect God to work it out for your good. Expect Him to work it out for your good. All things work together for good to them that love God. And then finally, one final thought. Give thanks in faith. Give thanks in faith. Amen is like this. If I ask you for 10,000 men, you'll scratch your head, think about it, and say, all right, next week. All right, thank you, man. But it's a half-hearted thank you. You see, because I'm wondering, one week, maybe hey, that's seven days, this guy's going to get into his car and drive away, and we're going to see him. Maybe in two days' time, we're going to hear this handsome great. So it's a half thank you. But if you give me the 10,000 on the spot, I'm going to give you a big thank you. It's not going to be like a small one that comes when you say, wait a week. So sometimes we are like that with God. When we pray, we say, thank you, Lord. And it's a half of the thank you. Because we're thinking like, ah, uh, you know, maybe he's going to change his mind. <laughs> you know? Or maybe something else is going to happen. So it's like, oh, thank you, Lord. But can you thank him like you already have it? Because that's true for you. Hallelujah. If you trust someone, you know they're going to come through for you. So give thanks by faith after you have prayed about your challenges and the problems that you're facing. Don't do it politely, but do it in faith, knowing that God has heard you and approved an answer for you. He has dispatched aid to your side. You have been heard in an accepted time. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah.